Jen and Sonia, I believe, are both. Yep, Jen and Sonia are on the web. Oh, Jen and Sonia. Okay. Hello. All right. Well, first, Happy New Year to everybody. As well. Yes. Um, we have a quorum and then some, so that's good. Uh, I see no citizens, so I don't believe we have any citizens' comments. Um, we did get the uh, minutes issued for our December meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review those? Yes. <laughs> so could we uh, have a motion to accept the minutes? Motion to accept the minutes. Somebody want to second that? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? I'm so. here for the last bit of it, so I can't speak to the beginning. Yeah, I'd say yes. Okay, Sonia said yes, and Jen's Jen abstain. abstaining. Okay. Um, that takes us to the chair report. I don't have a whole lot to report. Um, uh, we did do our food pantry distribution today. We had uh, 137 families. Um, so the numbers, the numbers are remaining uh, very, very strong. Um, we're in the, I think I mentioned last month that we're, um, our appeal letter went out, so we're in the midst of our appeal. It's gone out to all every every mailbox in Walderboro, uh, Bremen, and Nobleboro, um, which are the towns that we serve. And uh, we're uh, so far the response has been uh, really overwhelming, tremendous. But we need more, so we um, put that out there. Um, and then just another real quick comment. So. Uh, most people know that we bought a van uh, uh, last year. And um, just uh, so the distribution of 137, um, probably about 35 of those families uh, we delivered to in the van. So those are folks that for whatever reason um, uh, can't get to the food pantry or in one or, or live in one of the designated er uh, areas that we serve like Sproul Block and some of those. And, I can never think of the names of the other two, but it was community Does small. That include Coles Hill, Coal Hill, and village. Office. Yes, Walterboro Village. Yeah. Right? Village. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and so that's uh, so we're doing good. We're uh, you know getting a lot of food out there uh, twice a month, and that's about all I have to report. Um, any questions on any of that? What's the max that the um, food bank could food carry, pantry. food pantry could carry for per per two weeks? So we, so the, what's the maximum number of families we could? So we've, uh, I think our max has been, and I'm completely on memory here, but I think it's like 165. That's the max it's been to, or is that the max that it could? Actually... That's the max that we've seen. Okay. So we, you know, we've there, there's quite a bit of food at the pantry. And so what happens is if we get an overwhelming response to our need, um, we can still fill that need, but maybe not with eggs or milk. We mm -hmm. can do canned goods and right. other, and we have a freezers full of frozen product that we can give folks. So there's no matter what, if you come, you're going to get, yeah. you're going to leave with food. Okay. It, you just might not get all the fresh Bacon stuff. And like, eggs, bread, yeah. Yeah. Butter and cheese. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Brussels sprouts and lima beans. At the end. Oh, I'm sure those are hot, hot <laughs> commodities. We actually, it, it amazed me some of the stuff that they get there that you like, uh, you know, canned meat and stuff like that. I've never seen before, but, it's, but it's there as a kind of a, an emergency if we ever need it. Um, okay, Ruben, that takes us to broadband. So broadband, um, it's 2023. I have a new mission slash obsession that I'm going to be hammering on at every meeting I go to from here on, <laughs> which is fiber at every doorstep. Um, even the places that have some version of fiber now, no one in Walderboro 
has the kind of connection that can meet the needs of, of a bursty type of internet connection. So people talk about speeds, how fast you can download, how fast you can upload. And it sort of misses the mark, especially when people talk about what do I need X speed for. And when you think about broadband, you're going to want to think about it differently. It's not, can I download the whole library of Congress in eight seconds? It's how much do I have to think about what is my internet doing right now? So in a world of not just Netflix and video games, but things like Google Docs or Office 365, or your iPhone automatically backing up photos with grandkids. Um, those are bursty workloads where my phone might not do anything for most of the day, but real briefly, it will flood that connection to send everything out, get it out of the way, get my device backed up and let me go on with my life. When someone buys a home or builds a new business, when, when future states get here, that's what you're competing with now. You can do that in the towns and all edges of us, but you can't do it here. And, and bursting is... Uh... So let's say you have a gigabit internet connection. People will think, oh, I'm not going to pull data down that fast all the time. Of course you're not. It doesn't matter. What you want to be able to do is when your connection's that fast, when you, when you burst, when you have a, a bursty workload, you'll very briefly use all that speed, get all your stuff done, and then get back off the highway and out of the way. Your task will be done. When you hit play on Netflix on something fast when it's coming into you on a fast connection, you don't see a spinning wheel. It's just going. Hmm. Um, the states you don't see about that are when your iPad, when your MacBook Pro and my Windows computer, um, these machines will back themselves up completely to a service. Most of the time baked in now, you don't even see it. Or, and I hope this doesn't happen to you, Bob, but let's say your MacBook needs to be reinstalled. That happens over the internet now. No one brings you a disk. You hit a button and you wait. Yep. The faster your connection, the faster that comes in. But the part before that that matters now on any modern device, even an Xbox, a PlayStation, smart TVs half the time, is how fast you can send that all back out. When you have a fast, modern connection, you're not waiting on those things. You don't know that they're happening. And it sounds like convenience, but that's just going to be a modern state of the world. You can't do that over cable. You can't do that over wireless. You can't do that over cellular. At all, or it'll be... It happens minutes. now, but it is much slower. Orders of magnitude slower. And you have to think about it, and you have to wonder, is it, is it, is done, it done yet? yet. Yeah. And those technologies have to be upgraded much more frequently. Once you get a fiber plant in, the numbers are all over the place, but a, a piece of glass, a piece of modern fiber, other than your basic brick-fix stuff, is good for the next century. It's been nice. We've worked with ISPs and we've done all these little things, but now it's time to lean in or, or go on to some other project. So that's going to be my obsession going forward. There's four books on the table, two copies of each. One is The Master Switch by Tim Wu, which is a history of communications technology over the last in the 20th and the early 21st century. The other is Fiber by Susan Crawford. Anyone that wants to take either of these home and read them, you can have them. Anyone that wants a copy, email me. I will buy you a copy. If you don't want to read the book, I will send you a link to the Audible version. This is required education. This is going to give you, there's stuff in here you don't know you need to know. Um, and if you're going to be part of a solution, this is going to be required. What I'm offering to do is, is buy whoever wants the book, the book. I've mm -hmm. also sent a few more copies of these to the local library, and I'm distributing them at work as well because of unrelated but sort of connected work I'm doing there for telehealth and things like that. Does would these books be valuable at the secondary school level? Oh, I'm sure they would. And there's I don't I haven't taken any to the school, but I think I've got two copies of each of these in the local library. I took those in last year. I guess my real question is, when you're saying you're going to beat us with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because we're in a committee that should be working on this. Right. How does that? Does and I, I don't just mean here. Anyone on the select board except Bob, who has one. I've already uh, ordered both. <laughs> and, and Ruben's right. They are absolutely essential. I ordered copies before I came in, so I'll be bringing those in. So, so my question is still afloat here. Um, mm -hmm. How, how, what would its value be to a high school senior? To a high school senior, it's a whole different value because that will give them a handle on sort of how the modern world works in terms of communications. This touches. I don't care what you do. This technology touches your life. And you're, right. you're better off understanding not just it, but the history of how we got to where we are. Yeah. Okay. The thing that, if I may, the thing that impressed me most about the Crawford book is how far behind we are. Mm. Everybody else gets it. We don't. And we're just, we're Maybe just. Who's everybody else? Yeah, who's there and who's South we? South Korea, yeah. like Scandinavian countries, oh. Japan, they all, China, and, and they the parts all of the US. get it. 
Yeah, we're, we're starting. And to we there. don't. Yeah. And we're stuck in this structure that, I mean, try to convince Spectrum to upgrade to fiber. Good luck. How are you going to do it? Yeah, Spectrum's got its own upgrades. I'm not arguing for a specific. I know you're not. I'm being. Oh, I know, but this is recorded. So I'm, I'm, you and I have talked a hundred yeah. times about yeah. this, Bob. This, this general things. I'm not arguing for any specific solution, whether that be municipal fiber or telling a given ISP they have to upgrade their technology. The, the companies that want to provide this tech are there and we'll talk to them. Um, I would love a spectrum or whoever to prove me wrong and deliver something I don't think they can. And I'm certainly not challenging them there because this isn't going to be, at least for a while, this isn't going to be the only solution, but this needs to exist in our ecosystem because there are secondary benefits to everything, anything from pricing competition to cable, cellular, um, and other wireless internet connections are based on a strong fiber optic network. Um, and the stuff we have here, we have pieces of it, but we by no means have a complete modern system. Is the hmm. federal money that's afloat out there, does that fit into this discussion? Oh, some of it absolutely does. There are planning grants, there are grants to get these things built out. And there's a lot of conversations we haven't started yet. And that's, we need to figure out how far we can get. And then we need to figure out what our, our threshold is, for what we're willing to do to complete this project too. And towns around us are comparable or ahead or behind? We're behind almost everyone around us. Somerville is having some problems, by the way, because of insurance. Now, the other thing I want to point out is other towns around us aren't doing things like, this is a full service town. This is not criticism of where we spent our resources. Mm -hmm. Waldeburg is doing some incredible things. Fiber connectivity is my pet project. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I mean by all of this. There's there's decisions we've made that I would a thousand percent encourage us to, to make again. It's not that I think we need to to fix something we've done wrong before. I'm trying to figure out how we take the next step to get this connectivity out there to go along with all the other great things we have. I love living less than five miles away from a full police station or fire department. I can only imagine how much better it would be if I also had my choice of connectivity. And when people are looking at homes and wanting to live and do business here. That's going to be part of that. So that is my broadband speech. For you. So uh, can I ask oh, a question? Of course. Yeah, like how much is it going to cost to install this? Um, and what is it to the consumer, like for monthly charges? Now, as so, you know, everybody's with the cost of living and inflation going on, people are making hard choices. I know we're looking down the window, mm -hmm. but offering them a service that's going to cost them twice as much as what they're paying right now, would they have the option not to sign up for broadband if you put it in just because of a cost basis? Well, if yeah, you're talking not. 200, like you got to remember people's average salaries are 45,000 or yeah. under that in the area. All so, right. The tax you know, increases raised people's property taxes, three or 400 bucks. So, I'm just asking on a cost basis, can this be affordable? Ruben, do you mind if I jump in? On Max, this you're a great guy to jump in. So part of, part of how much the project will cost is going to be a planning grant that we have to do first. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been talking about for the past few months. And that's what we have to go through with the Island Institute and then finding that willing partner to do it as well. And then we're going to have an estimate for how much it is going to cost to do this fiber to the home model. Uh, and that's something that the voters will have to decide. Uh, it depends based on each town. Um, Washington, Jefferson, Somerville, they're all doing some different projects. Jefferson's doing one where LCI is going to own all the fiber. And I think that's going to be less than what Washington and Somerville are going to have to pay, mm -hmm. which are going to do their own municipal networks. Um, how much it's going to cost, it will depend who we have for our partner in this. If we do LCI, they market 70 bucks a month i think I don't, I don't know i'm just other other fiber isps market their high well not their high end but their gigabit sort of standard high end connection at 70 a month yeah when that happens you're competing with other isps so spectrum spectrum's goal by their shareholders mm -hmm. is to get to a 100 dollar a month standard connection that price is going to be higher unless there's someone competing with something that's as good or better then your price is fine. That's where we talk about secondary benefits. We need to get to that planning grant before we can, the whole purpose of having these conversations and starting this and getting a planning grant, Sonia, is so we can start answering the rest of your questions. What is the boiler plate cost of the install? 
what does that medium look like? What are the plans? Um, but we're not suggesting necessarily or even primarily that Waldoboro build and own a network. That's not what this is. So we couldn't tell you what those plans would be. If you were um, if you were consolidated communications, we put Fidium in. Their plans are 50, 60, and 70 dollars a month for the first two years. And then if you qualify is that just for, for American internet connect connectivity, is it that is. just okay? Because because you know, regular standard cable can be anything from $14. So you're talking at you're talking about a $60 price increase for people. That $14 number is, I'm not sure what you're connecting that to. I That's what I'm paying for my internet. I'm paying $14.99 a month for my internet. And then I'm paying for a landline because I can't get a signal where I live. So, so my whole bill is 98 bucks, but that's just internet and the, the phone. This might be worth having a conversation offline because I can tell you there's no way your actual internet is $14.99 a month. I'd be more than willing to take my time and go over your cable bill with you. But so I, I can read my own cable bill. Crossed. And I discussed it with the Spectrum people. There's different yeah. speeds that you can get. They go up depending yep. on your speed. So I have a specific lower plan. Yes. So this is, we're, we would get into the weeds here. We could, we could go on. Yeah. on. So yeah, just, you know, but I'm just, I just want to point out, because I hear everybody, these plans and people are paying, planning to spend money. But this money comes from state and federal, but those are taxes that people are paying. So you're adding more expenses on to people's daily lives. So like you want to do, do you want to also discuss ways to find that you could like improve the economy to in order to afford something like that, you know, before you go spending the money? Can you um, spend money part, off the town so budget? Part, Is that so a talk for the what? selectmen? So, so part of the, the challenge is that in order to attract the businesses that we would want to attract to get those sorts of jobs, one of the things we have to be able to provide is fiber connection to the internet. So, so it, you know, you've got to, you've got to kind of create the base and it, to, to satisfy the need for these companies that we would want to attract to come in for those high paying jobs. You it doesn't know, go the other have, way around. You know those you companies, what they would be, what companies you want to bring in, the type of companies that yeah. would want that? Would it be a, like a factory, manufacturing plant, a financial office? It could be anything. It could be a lawyer's office. It could be an accounting firm. It could be It could be any kind of business. They're going to want high speed internet. For the for the reasons that Ruben mentioned, which is you know this is the future. So, just to stop with just to prevent us from doing a lot of back and forth, um, the step the next step is to just at least talk about a planning grant first, so we know what this even looks like, mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a drop in the bucket, a drop of a drop in the bucket compared to everything. And when we even get to that point, we may decide we need we may not want to have to go forward or we may have to wait for a large grant to come along. So we are getting into the, uh, the weeds of this thing. And I think if there wants to be that type of discussion it could, um, between Ruben and Sonia to talk about the internet plans, because Sonia, I'll be very interested in uh, 14 99 for internet. I didn't want to know what you're getting, where you're getting that. Cause I kind of want that deal. Exactly. But, uh, but, we also do have Jen's hand up, and then we do want to try and get to the rest of the planning uh, sure. economic meeting items that are on the okay. agenda tonight. So go ahead, Jen. Hi. Um, I just wanted to put Sonia's mind at rest that nothing's going to happen, Sonia, at all until it goes in front of the townspeople for a vote. Mm -hmm. And what these guys are just talking about now basically is getting that planning grant so that we can gather the data that we need to make even suggestions for the future, right? First, we have to do the planning grant, gather the data and find out what's really, what the costs and benefits and all that other kind of stuff is. All of the questions you have, Sonia, are way down the road. We can't possibly know the answers to all of that yet, right? It's way, way down the road. What we're talking about now is just setting a foundation up 
of data and information so that we can put it in front of the people and the future and decide on different types of projects and whether or not to go forward. All right? Well, well put. Jumping up to the 10,000 foot level with the yes, even weeds entirely, I can't remember how long ago it was, but somebody, might have been you, um, compared this process to the electrification of New England. That's one of my favorite I, things. Do yeah. that. Where are we now? Are, are we at the point we've decided we want AC instead of DC? Or wh where are we now in that analogy? That's We're trying to figure out what it would cost and if, if the town would even have the appetite to do what it needs to do to get wired. To get wired electricity. Yeah. yeah. If we're doing that in that comparison. I, I find that very useful a long way from the weeds. But just that 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 perspective of we did a process like this 150 years ago, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and uh, we're doing the new version. Yeah, data connectivity is the new telecom. Copper phone lines are going away and being superseded by data infrastructure. Thanks. All right, good. Oh. Bob has his hand up. Just, oh, yeah, Bob, I, sorry, I just, uh, right in front of me. Is it possible to construct a timeline so we could set out our milestones in this process. When do we apply for the grant? When do we expect a decision on the grant? If we don't get a grant, what's our next step, if any? Um, I mean, we've been talking about this for some time now, and we know the money's out there. We know we've identified a source for that money. We haven't identified a partner yet. It would be nice to have a timeline setting out what our steps are to be and when when we're going to take those steps. I think we could have suggestions for that by the next meeting. If that's reasonable. That would be fantastic. Yep. I'll set up a thing for next meeting. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, is it Moore's law that describes the doubling of technology every 18 months? Is that accurate? So Moore's law is that specifically around processing power. Mm -hmm. um, throughput is, you know, the, the amount of data you can move over a given pipe is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It's also a little harder to measure in that if you take what we're talking about and take it to another ISP, they'll tell you they don't see the demand for that, but you have to couple that with they're using technology not capable of what delivering what we're discussing. I understand that. I guess I'm using it in a generic sense of, I guess I have a bit of a concern seeing how quickly technology is um, escalating and things are becoming more and more available to people um, that, this process is going to take a few years. And by that point, you know, a couple of years down the road, there's going to be this new technology that's oh, doubled or tripled the availability of what's useful. And we've spent all this time and money on something. And I'm totally speaking, not, not necessarily out of turn, obviously you know far more than I do, but you know, I'm, I guess I'm trying to be the 11th man here. You understand? So what we're describing in terms of a, of a fiber network, um, if you built a brand new fiber network today and, and use that magical term gigabit speeds, that's great. You can do that over one piece of glass. That one piece of glass will scale up to multi hundreds of megabits using existing technology. What we're talking about here, this is 30 and 40 year old technology that we're mm -hmm. just trying to get up on the poles and running. So demand is increasing, but what you can supply over this is going to outstrip that for quite some time if you build it properly. Okay. Okay. All right, good discussion. Um, town updates, Max. So uh, planning board's gonna be meeting on the 12th uh, to review a gravel pit up on Simon Road. Uh, this is just uh, an item that's been tabled for some time. And uh, there's gonna be a special planning board meeting on the 26th for a pre-application for the former 80 Gray School or uh, turning into affordable senior housing units. Uh, Walsh Engineering is representing Volunteers of America for that meeting, and they're just giving a, a very tip of the iceberg type overview of the project. Um, What's the date again for that? 26th of this month. Okay. Uh, 6 p.m. is when they meet. Um, nothing's approved at that meeting because it's only a pre-application. The whole point is just to get some initial feedback, mostly from the planning board. If there are some concerns raised by the neighbors that uh, who will be sent a note, separate notice, um, 
then obviously they're welcome to voice it at the meeting. But nothing's going to be committed at the meeting. The board can't say, yeah, this standard will be waived or this will be approved now. It's just an it's just an informal discussion, pretty much. Does the town have the authority now with the, the votes that have been made to move forward with a project at AD Gray? Or does that still need to go back out for a vote to the town? Uh, I think Julie is on. Come on. No, it's, that's been approved by the voters. It does not have to go back out to the town. Okay, good. Awesome. So that's, that's pretty much all I have for at least the planning board items. Um, other town updates. I don't know what that was. <laughs> uh, I don't think that much has really happened since the last meeting. I can't think of too much. Could we ask Julie to give us an update on the community center and where that stands? <laughs> it, I'm going to take a wild guess that the same, it's going to be the same thing that I say every month of no update. Julie, do we have any updates on the community center? Um, not really. Um, okay. We are still working with Lincoln Health. And um, when I have an update, everybody will know. All right. Thank you. Can I, before the meeting, I asked the question. I got a notice of an auction on my computer the other day um, up at 385 Main Street, I think it is, the, at the intersection of Route 1 and Old Route 1 at the top of the hill where the, there was a fiber company up there that's selling off its stuff. Um, it seems like if it, there's a world of free enterprise and someone's going to sell and buy that land, but it seems like it's a, a location that, that the represents opportunities now you were saying that we don't have sewer and water up that far correct what would happen if we did would, would that be a place we should think about sending i mean it's downhill all the way back so we don't need a pump how much land is it i don't know uh, and well that's the other thing there's not that much land really okay. i didn't know if it's just a tip of the point there or what it was it, it would probably satisfy an initial um building for what it would probably satisfy an initial building for what uh, Lincoln Health has said they wanted but it doesn't really help get our community center there as well and it doesn't really take into account future expansions either so what was the address uh, 585 or something it's it's, it's right it, where where you go up old rule one and you wait and see new rule one is that, the, is that Weintraub's property? Yes, yeah. exactly. I think it was it. Yes. It's a nice building. Yeah. I don't know what the acreage is, but it's a really interesting piece of land with all that frontage on both roads. Oh, is that what the chicken barn is? Uh, no. Okay. No. It's got a tool repair place in a sort of a trailer in front of it. Huh. It's got a, a silo on one end for putting fiber in. I don't know. I missed that. I guess I know which way I'm going to work tomorrow. I can't think of where it is. It's right across from Ralph's Homes. It's next to the town forest. Oh, oh the okay. opposite. Yeah, the other back up. The other end. Yes. The other end. <laughs> I was doing the same thing. Yeah, I was like, like, what? What? <laughs> okay. Um, other than that, Julie, do you have any other town updates? I'm sure she's just getting a list prepared in her mind. That's probably a no. Um, so it uh, takes us to um, old business. So you're going to update us on the MDOT work in Waldeboro. So Julie informed me when she got back that um, that intersection that everyone was wondering why I haven't done anything on. She's already been doing that. <laughs> That's already in the works. So um, we're just waiting on updates from that. Is that Main and Friendship Street? Yes. And we actually met with MDOT last Tuesday with John and Will from Public Works to talk about some other intersections that are in town um, that are also high, well, notable crash areas that are in the community. Um, 
just to go over some potential project ideas and um, what it would result, what would need to be done by the town to try and get those addressed. And that's something that we're, we talked about. I'm blanking on their names right now. Um, Make town, Kaler's corner, uh, Washington. Yep. Yeah. Usual suspects. Um, and some of them have easy ways of addressing them, and it's just a matter of... Uh, Could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Julie. Oh, so you heard what I said? I no, did not. No, we did not. You were mute the whole time. <laughs> I was mute the whole time, but I, I was fearful of that. Um, we are working currently on our budget. We just started working on the budget. We just lost you again. Anyways, we I went. think it's a bad internet connection. Yeah, I was thinking it but, might be um, closing here. End around. of February, beginning of March. We lost you again. We um, lost you again. Julie, you're breaking internet. So that's where our focus is. I just wanted to mention about AD Grace 2. Um, we still have not finalized our final agreement with um, Volunteers of America. That is something that we have to do. Um, and that remains to be done. Um, it does not have to go back to the voters. And I mentioned that we just concluded a very, uh, 145 families re received food baskets and wow. over, I believe it was 200 children received um, coats, boots and gifts through donations through the, um, from the town. Um, our community navigator program is very busy, as you can imagine, right now. Um, we just found out that one of the sources that we use for heating oil um, appears to be taking a break. Um, so um, we're anticipating some uh, an influx of people for resources. And the budget is the hottest ticket right now for the next few months. All right. I have a note for the community. Did you hear me that time? Yes, we did get you that time. Do we know if the community navigator is aware of the, the American Connectivity Program? I did tell uh, Karen Ann about that after the last meeting. Perfect. Thank you. That's where someone can get connected and have a discount on there or rebate of yeah. some sort on yeah. there. Every ISP works with it. It's a $30 a month off. It can be any plan. So even if you have a high-end plan and you have a bunch of kids in school, you get that discount off of there. Um, Julie, I was telling everyone about that for the MDOT intersections, you sent something for the Village Partnership Program, and uh, we've been talking with them about some other dangerous intersections in Waldeboro. Uh, do you have any notes on or any additional items to provide for that? No, I guess you didn't hear me before either, did you? Probably not that part. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, did you go over which intersections they're going to improve? Banktown, Kaler's, and um, the Washington Old Augusta Road one. Yes. I think those were the ones. Yeah. Yes. But Kaler's, um, I'm not sure when that will be done. That was basically, they're looking at Kaler's. They didn't have anything planned there but it was the removal of the pole. Oh. And we, 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 we plan to include um, in our upcoming budget, which is what I said before, um, the funding match for that DOT downtown grant. Any other questions on the DOT stuff? Sounds good. All right. All right. And that takes us, uh, Julie, is that it? Yes. Thank you. Um, that takes us to, uh, I don't think there's any other old bill. Well, maybe I should ask, we made a motion to, um, to I mean, we don't approve it, but to support the, um, the survey that you were going to 
the uh, funding for the survey. So is that moving forward or maybe you could give us an update on that? That would be old business, I guess. Serve. The Talking survey. about the broadband survey? Yeah. What is it called? No, no, no. The, I thought we were going to do, um, I have to go read the minutes again, but we were going to, uh, the, the select board has to approve the funding, but that we were, we had supported funding for oh pursuing a planning grant. Yes. Um, I mean, I haven't gone to the select board because for the last two or so meetings they've had, I've assumed they've been busy with the board of assessors meetings. So I haven't wanted to interfere with that. And I also have to get a planning grant prepared. So I'm doing that now. Okay. Um, it's just going to take, uh, I mean, by next month, I'll have a timeline laid out for what that's going to look like. That's moving forward. That is moving forward. All right. Um, well, Jen, I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, last meeting, I believe you were at the Lincoln County, you were at a Lincoln County meeting about housing. Do you, do you want to talk about that? Well, that was really interesting. Um, I participated in initially earlier in the afternoon or late afternoon before the meeting, um, I participated in a focus group that was comprised of a small number of, of um, people who were more involved um, in large businesses and or small businesses who are reporting just how much trouble they're having in recruiting uh, people because they cannot find this includes Miles Hospital and um, the lab, Bigelow Lab, I think it is down in Booth Bay. They, this, the people that they're wanting to offer jobs to who make decent salaries can't find anywhere to live within commuting distance. Mm. And so for they're turning down jobs. Um, and so the consultants that are doing the housing study in Lincoln County uh, wanted to hear directly from, and they had three of these sessions to hear from people who were being directly impacted by different variations on housing. Um, and uh, just as an aside today, I received an email from uh, one of our local businesses that uh, has already lost, well, is reporting losing a very good staff person who couldn't find housing after searching for months, something that they could afford um, and that they could commute from back and forth. And they're afraid they're gonna lose this other person uh, who is great, they say, for their business. And they're asking me to please spread the word that um, they need housing. And, and so I'm gonna try to see what we can do. But, um, the meeting after the focus group meeting was <clears throat> the um, consultants were presenting some of their uh, initial findings in the data about how housing and uh, the cost of housing, the availability of housing has um, increased or decreased in, I, I can't remember the, the year range of years, <clears throat> but they were using census data initially, and they are also planning to go to each town individually to get more recent data um, from different sources, actually, uh, on the turnover of properties in the last three years, um, what that's done to prices and rentals, um, homelessness, uh, all the different aspects of what's going on with housing. And it, it, they did present us with a um, draft of the initial data, a draft document of the initial data that they have found. And they will be continuing to work on it. It's fairly hefty uh, information. Uh, it's a very interesting, very interesting project. And I'm hopeful that it will result in a in useful information with some suggestions uh, for each of our towns, perhaps, of uh, how we can move forward. The, one of the other interesting things that I heard was the number of different businesses and, who are coming together 
to actually um, renovate uh, buildings into seasonal worker dorms like. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, people have mixed feelings about that because it's taking potential rental properties off the market that could house families. Um, instead, using these these seasonal dorms are not used year round usually. So there's there's a lot of discussion. It was a very interesting um, two meetings to attend. Uh, and if anybody is interested in you know, getting more information or even knowing more about it or participating with, I don't know. I don't know exactly how it's all gonna play out, but it, it's compelling. It's very compelling. Is there anywhere to review that information that was discussed at that meeting? No, not yet. It's it's right in the beginning of being used. It was um, it's about four weeks ago. So they haven't put it into uh, they haven't put it into writing or anything like that. Um, so I don't think it's available right now. They had several meetings, not just the two that I was at, where they were talking directly to large employers um, about their concerns on what's really going on for them. So I don't know how that will be disseminated if, if it will be. I don't think they're doing videos. I'm sure that it's somewhere, but... Um, if you have specific information you're looking for, you could contact the Lincoln County Regional Planning Office down there and uh, talk to Mary Ellen Barnes. And okay. see if she can suggest. Um, and I'm sure if there's, you know, anybody who wants to submit anecdotal, you know, things about your own business or whatever, I mean, it's good to hear from everybody what's going on. Did it seem like there was a, a conclusion? I mean, that either there's not enough houses, they're too expensive, or we're not paying enough. Uh, uh, no, it's it's actually interesting, George. Um, you know, a lot of property has not just that the prices have been driven up over the last two years. Like to me, it seems astronomically high. But not just that, but so many properties have been taken out of the rental market and turned into Airbnbs. It, uh. It's making a dramatic shift in the number of available year round rentals. So okay. also the other thing that they're finding is that there are less, dramatically less properties for, I can't remember what you call it, but for entry into housing, owning a house, and for people to downsize to, dramatically less than there were. So it's it's really like a stuck kind of a situation. You know, it's we used to have a flow, at least there was a flow, right? <laughs> Did you get a sense that it was a certain distance from the coast or all around here or is it uh, It's, that's interesting. I don't have that sense. Right now, I did feel it from the businesses that I heard um, that were closer to the coast so that they were having a much more difficult time getting housing for their staff. Um, so that could be a possibility, but um, it is housing, the price of housing took a, a, just a crazy jump. I mean, you can even, I, I've looked, you know, I mean, it's, I think it's starting to settle inland a little bit, but it is, it was dramatic. And um, I know the prices are starting to even out a little bit and there's less activity buying and selling, but you know, it, uh, and I'm hopeful, I'm really hopeful that it starts to become more sane because that, it's, that affects all of us, that affects every one of us. Did they connect the uh, increase in cost to the um, pandemic? I mean, everybody was buying property yeah. sight unseen. I mean, in other words, is, yeah. was that inflection point that we're now past? Well, it seems to be. I mean, I've been doing a lot of reading about this, not just in Maine, but all over the country. And it seems that that has settled and maybe some people will be deciding, you know, not to, not just, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen if the cities can pull people back or not. 
but I know that there, I read some articles uh, this week in the New York, um, New York Times and Wall Street Journal about huge office buildings in New York and other big cities where they're actually discussing to turn them into housing because housing so desperately needed and offices still haven't returned to what they were before. And that may be a permanent shift, who knows, with more people working flexibly. Um, but it was, it's, it's really quite compelling to hear um, that our businesses are losing good candidates that, from good paying jobs that can't afford to live here. And that's compelling to me. So this is, an, maybe I'll wait till we're at new business, but um, this is an interesting idea that actually how can the is, town we can already say this is kind of new business at this point i just <laughs> i just didn't have i just didn't put it on there i should have asked jen like last week when i was making the agenda so on so we'll we'll jump to new business so my thought is how can the town and how could the edc kind of facilitate housing because so, it, it, we can't attract work if we can't attract workers we're not going to attract business right and here's the other part of that people don't think about. If we can't, if our businesses can't survive, right? You have to have workers to keep it open. Right. If they can't open enough days of the week to, to pay their bills and survive. Then the tourists won't have anywhere to visit and go to. And tourism is one of our main industries. And so sometimes people don't think about these issues as far as they actually have impact, right? I mean, it's it could pull a major part of our economy down if we don't de deal with this on a larger scale. You know, it's not just a one town problem. I mean, it's, it's up and down the coast for sure and inland a bit at least. Um, and so it is, it is important to think about, it's also important to look at how other communities. So once we get this report out, which I think the report is due in February sometime, sometime between February and March. And once we get that report and get it disseminated and have a chance to go through it and look at it, and, and then maybe it can become something that we can consider um, and make part of our, of our agenda at times. You know, Jana, I'm just not Pat, sure how you. Patty's how, got a. Patty's had her hand up for a bit, actually. Yes, I'm sorry. So, in reference to what the town could potentially do, other communities across the country that I've been reading about are taking a really strong look at their zoning laws. They're looking at how can we make adjustments to allow for denser housing, smaller housing, accessory units. Things like that. Isn't that AD 2030? LD 2003. And yeah, that's actually. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, zoning was going to be one of the things I was going to say. So thank you for bringing that up, Patty. And that LD 2003 is also partly why I'm not doing too much because we kind of address a lot of it already in the ordinance. Like we allow housing pretty much anywhere at this point. I think the only place we don't allow housing is the industrial district, unless, George, you want to. Give a, you can't even have a daycare center there. So yeah, yeah, you can. We changed that. Well, then, thank God. We, you were on the, you were on the committee and specifically pushed for that to happen. Do you, do you want insane? a daycare center there? <laughs> no, I should have said nothing then. Um, but yeah, housing's allowed pretty much anywhere in town, and minimum lot size. Let, well, that's one of the things I. But, how do, but would, how do you entice an investor to come into town or a group of? local people to pool their money and and build an apartment or, or some kind of multi-unit housing to, to help alleviate like i don't think one building is going to make a difference i think having every individual in the town so do something to, you know on their own not necessarily just, on their own but incentivize people to you've already got housing there it's just do we know how many a, empty houses there are in Wilmore? i have no idea just to quickly finish with patty's thought on the zoning we allow accessory dwelling units. We allow, or accessory apartments, I should have said. We do incentivize bonuses if you're on sewer and water and have a lot of different ways where we do try and 
make our area enticing for someone to build or at least do their part by just having a little accessory for the mother-in-law or whatnot. And I, we even have like a duplex incentive where you could build like a townhouse that's split in two. You own one half, someone owns the other half, and you don't even need to do the, the density for the other half. That I didn't even realize that until recently. Um, but with LD 2003, I kind of have to wait and see that actually goes through or not. Because that's the only, I think the only changes we'd have to do in the town is just allowing affordable units, which is a whole different density thing. But um, it doesn't sound like we need a low income housing. No, we need how we need housing for entry level employees, basically. So th these are folks working, yeah. earning a living. That you know they need a reasonable rent, whatever reasonable rent is. So, I, so I don't even know. Minimum oh. wage has, you know, I keep interrupting. Minimum wage, there's, a, there's some arithmetic somebody could do to figure out how cheap housing has to be if you're starting for one minimum wage earner. Or if you just look at average income, which she was just saying is 45000 a year, that means you can afford about an $80,000 mortgage. That's, that's counting a single, single earner. You know, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Yep. What was that, Jen? And remember that that the things that I was hearing about from professional staff in Miles Hospital and the scientists at the Bigelow Lab cannot find housing they can afford within a commuting distance. So that tells you that if all you have to do is start looking at what range of pricing is missing in the market, right? And, and start to look at, and actually a realtor might have a lot of information that they might share or whatever, I'm sure. And maybe Daryl. And if you're looking at a typical three, three bedroom house or whatever, two bathroom, what are those going for now? What were those going here? I'm sure when, the, when that study comes out, a lot of that data will be in there. It'll be very interesting to read. Jen, do you think that these employees are looking for rental properties or are they looking for houses to buy? I'm sure that the people who were um, at the level of the scientists and the professional staff, as long as they weren't being hired into temporary jobs, like temporary projects, like, a, you know, you might have a scientist there for the length of a grant, maybe three years or whatever, maybe they would rent and that would be okay. Um, but uh, people who are planning to stick with a job and settle down, they're gonna be looking to buy. And I've been looking at rents and I've been seeing two bedroom rents, two bedroom rents going from fourteen hundred to seventeen hundred dollars a month for two bedrooms. Does that include utilities? No, it depends on the thing. But they're also asking for first, last, and security deposits. <laughs> I mean, I think we've got some, some time before that market drops out with the, with the interest rate where it's at right now and the the cost of the homes, nobody's buying right now. So it's a matter of interest rates coming down, which we all know that's not happening anytime soon. So go up. what's that? They're going to go up. They're definitely going to go up. Um, so it's just a matter of waiting until the housing prices come down until everybody comes to reality and goes, if I want to sell this house, I have to drop the price. It's going to be the 20% it went up in the pandemic plus some in order to start moving houses again. So I think we've got plenty of time in order to come up with a game plan because nothing's happening tomorrow. So the question is, is that going to be in phase with when people are deciding to take or not take a job here? Yeah. All right. So maybe just temporary housing right now is something to focus on, like traveling nurses or traveling medical professionals. So in terms of what the town can do, um, one thing that uh, Maine State Housing Authority has just developed is a new program where they're using the Genesis Fund as a consultant, where they're going to work with willing towns, with willing developers to try and address the housing, trying to get a housing project in the area. Uh, so I'm going to be reaching out to them, trying to get something going. Can we offer incentives, tax incentives for them to do that to the developer? Well, I don't want to show the full hand. <laughs> Uh, the point is just to at least talk with them first, just to see if there is a developer who, I think with Lincoln County, there's a developer who does want to build in the area. And it's just a matter of saying, 
we're a town that's very interested in having some housing in this area. Um, Sonia, were you going to say something and I just interrupted or? Well, but you're, well, it's land prices. It's, I was thinking you might want to look at building ordinances too. Some mm -hmm. of the stuff like there's some requirements that some builds have to have sprinklers in them. And this is a regular single family home. You might look at some of those regulations and stuff that's not really safety related, but could help reduce, reduce building expenses too. Did we ever get like a final? The building code's the building code, so you can't get around that. Well, not well, well you can change that. In commercial, in commercial construction, if the population of the town is more than 5,000, there's a higher standard you have to meet like on sprinkler systems. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the rules do change. At it. So I was thinking we should have few people leave. <laughs> About 200 people. Yeah. Well, that frees up the houses then. There you go. I got a plan. <laughs> Props off. Some of us can just die real quick. Right. Some of us, yeah. Um, and I gotta get rid of this high speed internet. That's attracting no, people no, too much money. And clearly, Jan, to answer your question on incentives, yes. We are, I mean, that is one of the, well, that's not exactly, but we are amending the TIF <clears throat> so that there are projects that would fall under that affordable housing, workforce housing category. Yep. So if, there's some land that could be that uh, we could extend the sewer and water to, and that can finally, someone may say, well, we'll buy this land, we'll develop apartments, but we need sewer and water here. Can you help us there? And then we that's where do we do that. That's yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to sell the land to somebody to, why don't, why does the town? Well, we don't own, we wouldn't own the land. Well, but it so would, say, for instance, the town did own the land. Would it be that unusual for the town to make some revenue versus just selling it off, getting some taxes? Like you get instead of get, I get cash flow on a regular basis for the town. If you were to develop your own, so the town would own the land that has the apartments on it. Correct. Like I, the, like where we were talking about putting the bentonite over the uh, Sylvania site. Mm -hmm. I think with that you're going to get a lot of people in town who made. I mean, it's an opinion thing, but um, there's the liability insurance that we're going to have because we then have to keep up the the apartments to a certain standard. And sure, it's. I mean, this is all stuff that the any any developer is going to have to do anyways, right. and they're able to do it and still make cash flow on it. So it seems like you'd want to just keep that cash down. Well, what some towns also do or started to do is what they call a land bank authority, where a town would get a property at a very low value, like something that some rundown parcel. The town would get it at a low value, sell it at around that time when the housing market really does need that type of. Um, use it would be then sold to that developer and then the developer can just use it rather than right now it's a hot market so some people probably don't want to sell the land unless they can get 200,000 right. for a rundown place that was kind of what I was joking about with someone earlier when I was showing them around the one room schoolhouse near 80 gray it was like oh man this place is going to fall down any minute I'm like yeah but you know this could still get 200,000 in this market <laughs> right <laughs> but like uh, you know when the crash inevitably happens and that person's trying to get rid of it as soon as they can. And they're willing to sell it for 50 town could get it for 50. And then when there's this need for housing, again, town sells it for 50, 75, then continues again. Say settling. Don't say crash. I think why don't we uh, transitory. Why don't we, why don't we put this into old business next month? As soon as and then we'll we we'll just action everybody here to kind of brainstorm a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of what are some of the things that we could do as a town to um, incentive some create some kind of incentive. I know part of the challenge is like we're talking about new housing, just the cost of building a new house. So you say, well, the rents are crazy. Well, if you got to pay three hundred thousand dollars to build it. That's you know, a start off. Think about it, much right. Being used. right top dollar right now yeah yeah, so, yeah it's yeah, crazy there are um, yeah, it's an interesting point there are contractors in the general area not just Walter borough that are looking at different ways to remedy the shortage of housing they're looking at building modular small modular units yep things that are quote unquote affordable and i say quote unquote because they're still Costs are still coming in at 175,000, which is still too high for 
someone who's earning forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, unless right. they have a whole big fat down payment somewhere. But you so could look, you know, maybe there are they could. People working on. But maybe there's a possibility for condominiums or mm -hmm. small townhomes that, mm -hmm. you know, we got to squeeze, find out what that price point is. That, and, and then the question is, is there some way of turning that price point into a home for somebody? I, I think $15 an hour, I think, works out to $30,000 a year paying. All right. Right. Yeah. And 30% and of that is 10 grand a year for rent. And that's way below what you were talking about. Yeah. Rent yes. is going for now. Rent is. You know, you know that's... some businesses I noticed are paying 18 to 20, maybe $22 an hour, but that's still only 40, 45,000. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at, so I've got, you know, two stepsons living in California, they've got three roommates running in a mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is not any, and they have good jobs, yeah, right. but any one of them can't afford to pay the rent. Right. Well, that's kind of the reality of the situation. And maybe you need a roommate. And that generation is used to millennials and Zers are all used to having roommates and house flat, you know, yeah. housemates. And so it wouldn't be an unusual, like my generation and older, we all think about like a single family home. You got one or two bedrooms, a spare bedroom, you know, it's like guess, your privacy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think with the newer generations, it's, it, it's almost the norm to, to not be so concerned. Like it's a shared living room, a shared kitchen. Like yeah. that's just, and maybe thinking in that direction as far as housing. Certainly on the rental scene. That, yes, that kind on of the rentals. Sense. Yeah. If it's, if it's I, know, I might point out they do that in Seattle, Washington. People are paying $900 a month to have a shared kitchen, and they just have a cot in a room in downtown yeah. Seattle. I don't yeah, know if it's still effective, but yeah. that's theirs, and they think that's a good deal. Yeah. And they, that's right. That's true for Boston. Yeah. All right, so we'll we'll, we'll keep that on. Um, that'll be on the next. That'll be on chance, next. Yeah. Give us a little more time to kind of kind of bash that around a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, any other discussion from the committee? Anything we've missed? You'd like to add on the new business front? All right, meetings adjourned. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.